at the end, um, we might have the speakers come to the front and, and you guys can ask questions. That's, that's intended at the end. Um, our next speaker is Roy Hange. And that was real close. You did real well, 15 minutes. I know it's difficult. So if we can uh, stick to that, the rest of you. And I'm sorry that the microphone's not here tonight. So um, if you do have a low voice, please try to pro project tonight because there's some uh, traffic sound. Roy Hange spent 10 years in the Middle East with the Mennonite Central Committee. In Egypt, three years, Syria, six years, and in Iran for one year, working at peace building, education, and development. He's tracked religious identity and conflict for 30 years and has taught courses on faith based peace building at Eastern Mennonite University and at UVA. He also pastors Charlottesville Mennonite Church. Thanks, Roy. for coming out tonight. I have one goal in this evening's presentation and that, that is to present uh, an overview of why that conflict in Syria is extremely difficult to solve and I'll tell one story to back into that. What I'm about to say is no defense of the regime in Syria. I spent six years there and I could tell hundreds if not thousands of stories about um, folks who have um, not done well from a human rights perspective in that regime. The story I'd like to begin with is in the mid-1990s. We were, my wife and I were taking a uh, researcher writing a book um, around Syria to visit different folks. We were in Aleppo with uh, the Archbishop of the Syrian Orthodox Church, Yohanna Ibrahim, who was a standing, member of the Standing Committee of the World Council of Churches. He had set up, set up a structured monthly encounter between Christians and Muslims in Aleppo to maintain good relations, to manage conflicts that arose as they did over business or culture or community disputes. So he said, you can't come to Aleppo and just talk to our community. I want you to meet a Muslim leader. So we went to meet the Muslim leader who then became the grand, current Grand Mufti. But he was a popular Muslim leader in Aleppo. And that day, my wife was taken out of the meeting to go to his wife's celebration called a Sofrat Maryam, a table of Mary for the celebration of her newborn son, who, which Muslims uh, in Syria celebrate, do that celebration to honor the fact that Mary was alone when Jesus was born, so no woman should be alone at the birth of their child. And they had a special party, it was a lot of fun, as, according to what my wife said. That <laughs> son, that son is, much, is, was, is about 20 some years old now, this is mid 1990s, early 1990s, I believe it was that son who was killed, son of the Grand Mufti, who was killed along with his college professor north of Aleppo in a car in one of the first early acts of violence um, in the Syrian resistance. I tell that story to set up three or four dynamics, to introduce um, four levels of conflict and four traumas that are locking the Syrian conflict in place and preventing a kind of powerful or creative transition similar to what happened in South Africa. I'd like you to think about these four levels of the conflict, none of which have the capacity to move, to move the, the country or the people involved in the conflict forward in the status of their conflict. First, the local. The first level of conflict is the ongoing sectarian or tribal tensions at the local level. People tended to live around each other. Uh, Baptum was the Christian quarter of the old city. Uh, around the Umayyad Mosque, the Muslim quarter. There was a Jewish quarter I lived near for a while. And many of the folks left in the 90s. People tend to live separately, so there were already latent suspicions between communities and sometimes tensions that the government tried to manage. And the legitimacy of the government was keeping peace, a forced peace, but keeping a peace that lasted a long time and managing the differences between those communities, which are which are much more complex than they are in many other countries in the Middle East. A second level of the tension, so as the, as the lid is popping off now, some of those local tensions are emerging. A friend of mine who's a Christian from central Syria talked about uh, their well being destroyed in, in the village that he's from and the pump, pump being taken away and, and because of local tension with tribal communities. At another level, there was a national tension between different groups. What do I mean by this? At a national level, you had from the French colonial presence in the 1920s and on, 
the setting up of a minority group, the Alawites, in control of Syria, in the same way the British empowered the minority Sunnis to control the majority Shiite in Iraq, a colonial move, the Belgians did that in, Uganda, in, in Rwanda, a colonial move to empower minorities meant that it was set up as politically unstable. And that political instability with majority Sunni rule was resisted by the Muslim Brotherhood numerous times, especially in the 1980s when there was a move against the government in violence and the government crushed the Muslim Brotherhood at multiple points, including the massacre in Hama of around 30,000 people. And I stood on the parking lot outside the hotel over which, um, which was built over top of that part of the city which was shelled and bulldozed by the um, by the Syrian government. So the national tensions in emerging involve the interplay of power moves between the majority Sunni, which has resisted before, which is split itself between some who appreciate what the government's doing and cooperate with the benefits that that forced peace has resulted in, while some other Sunnis who are calling for revolt. But that national network of tensions is emerging now where different subgroups, Christians, Kurds, Alawites, um, Sunni, uh, different Sunni groups are splintering along their old affinities. And the Ottoman Empire uh, ran Syria or greater Syria through a series of millets or local, locally organized systems of, of, of organization based or sectarian based uh, legal structures. So those regional and sectar those sectarian tensions within the country are emerging now. So you have chants in Aleppo, for, in Aleppo and previously in homes by some of the Muslim militant fighters, uh, Alawites to the grave and Christians to Beirut. So it's a kind of resorting and resurgence of some aspects of militant Islam that are expressed through the resentment structures naturally, nationally. So that's the second level. Third level is a regional tension. That is the question of whether there's going to be a Sunni column, a Sunni Muslim column down the middle of the Middle East, from the Caucasus to Turkey, to Sunni majority Syria, to Jordan, to the Gulf Arab states, or whether there will be, continue to be a Shiite crescent from Hezbollah controlled southern Lebanon, through Alawite, which is a Shiite splinter group, controlled Syria, to Iraq, which is now Shiite controlled, and to Iran, and then western Afghanistan is predominantly Shiite. So if the question is what the future nature of the Middle East will be from a regional level. And there are powers that are locking the conflict out of that regional interest um, that are, that are playing, playing out, with Iran significantly supporting uh, the Assad regime in Syria now. And then internationally, at the fourth level, the, the last lockup is between China, Russia, and the non-aligned states pretty much lining up against the United States, Europe, and Gulf Arab states over what can't happen. So those, those four levels each have a locked up structure. That is, their, their points in the community, in the country, in the region, and internationally that do not allow a movement for a creative resolution like there was in South Africa. And with those four levels of lockup, you don't have movement at one that could affect the other. There was the potential for that with the nonviolent, early nonviolent movement in Syria, where they were beginning to have network coalitions of folks who were saying, we can do this together, somehow. But the main impediment in Syria is, unlike Egypt, they had no ex very little, if not any, experience with civil society where it was illegal in Syria for any group of more than six people to meet who were not related by blood without a government permit. And I had experienced that many times myself. So Syria did not allow enough community interaction to have the social capacity to manage a peaceful trans transition without the government controlling what the content of that was. I agree with Helena's point that there needs to be some kind of staged and managed transition the question is how to get there because of four other levels of uh, tension that make this conflict very difficult. I'm going to refer to those as four communities' traumas. Vanek Vulcan from University of Virginia, who's worked at understanding how large group trauma works in affecting conflict, has a phrase he calls chosen trauma, where every group has a history of memories of violence from the past that affects the way that they look at the present. So if you look carefully at the Syrian conflict now, 
The majority of groups in Syria have a set of chosen traumas they're acting out of. The Sunnis have a majority status, but they've been repressed, uh, at least the militant expressions have been repressed by the Alawite regime. Many people have been imprisoned, beat, tortured, businesses taken, um, the Muslim Brotherhood was crushed. I met with Muslim Brotherhood officials in Jordan in, in exile. The Sunnis have a sense, a history of trauma at the hands of the Alawites. The Alawites themselves, have a, who are controlling Syria now, have a history of trauma at the hands of the Sunnis before the French put them in power. They were, they were persecuted terribly. They don't want to go back to that persecution time. The Sunnis don't want to go back to their persecution time. The Christians have a series, have had a fairly good situation in Syria the last while, but there was a massacre of Christians in the 1860s. When there, when there were tensions in greater Syria, and there were various points where there were, there were, there were tensions with the Christian minority fearing persecution under a more extremist Muslim regime in the future of Syria. And the Kurdish community, as the fourth community, has its history of not being allowed state or status or even legal status in Syria until right recently when the regime is playing, playing, um, playing the Kurdish hand. So those four, four larger subgroups in Syria each have their chosen traumas out, out of which they don't want to step because they're acting out of fear now for the most part. So if you combine the four levels of the conflict with those four sets of chosen traumas, the, the, the amnity construct, this construct of how people move against each other or for each other is locked up in a way that is not allowing a reasonable process. Um, in my last few minutes I'd like to focus on a few things that might provide a way through. Tomorrow begins the Feast of the Sacrifice in Muslim tr uh, tradition, Lakta Ibrahimi, the United States, uh, the United Nations uh, envoy who followed um, Kofi Annan after Kofi Annan quit. He was, he was caught by those eight elements and said this, this conflict is not movable. Lakta Ibrahimi is calling for a ceasefire and there are tentative hopes that the ceasefire will stick at least through, through the um, duration of the feast. That will be the first ceasefire. To establish a sense of trust or relationship, you need to stop the conflict for periods of time and hopefully expand the stopping of the conflict and have alongside of the ceasefire some kind of interaction. What usually happens when you have a ceasefire is the participants have to have some kind of interaction to arrange for the ceasefire. If you could span, expand the zone of that interaction to other elements other than just stopping the killing, you can begin a process of interaction that can become something more. And the United Nations has folks who can manage that kind of transition. There have been many Syrians who've been trained in peace building through Fulbright scholars. I know some of them. And they have a vision and some capacity to work at helping Syria as a nation manage the transition toward the future as Syrians. Another element of the struggle in Syria is that the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria never, to my knowledge, renounced violence. Correct me on this. Unlike the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, who operated as much as they could legally behind the scenes, inside and outside of Egypt, to eventually, through a gradual process of accruing power relationally, to transform what was a, a dictatorship in Egypt in Egypt through a gradual process, even, even participating with uh, various other non-religious groups in the nonviolent revolution in Egypt, even protecting Christians when they were praying while Christians were protecting Muslim and Muslim Brotherhood folks while they were praying in Tahrir. There's some fascinating videos you can watch. So the, Mus so the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria never, never renounced violence, never took a stance that could have the possibility of a creative interaction with the government. Whereas in Egypt, Muslim Brotherhood were allowed to be elected to parliament, but not under the Muslim Brotherhood name, under the Waft or other parties. So the challenge in Syria is the political structure of oppression that the Alawites had to set up as a 12% minority to control the country had a range of ways in which the necessitated a range of which, ways in which they stifled any civil interaction that could have helped in a future transition. And we're seeing the price of that right now. There are about 1,500 uh, foreign jihadists in Syria. There are uh, reports of weapons being moved from Libya to um, 
to the jihadists in Syria. There's significant fears now about the connections between some of those jihadists and Al-Qaeda, with the Al-Qaeda flag being flown. The, the next level of lockup is even, in, even the international community is getting cautious about uh, military intervention, not wanting to arm certain jihadist elements who by power of force might actually do what the majority of Syrians don't want done. And the challenge is now that as the situation is beginning to hit a state of chronic conflict, um, the international community is getting even more cautious. So the, the range of factors considering the potential out, outcomes of, the, of this conflict trajectory is, is, is beginning to get baffling. You, don't, you can't make this move without affecting that. And the challenge to moving forward in Syria is, is, is dismal. The question of the right to protect, which is the United Nations Responsibility. Responsibility to protect, thank you. Responsibility, R2P, it, which is a United Nations guideline for the use of force, has been raised a few times. Helena referred to that. The challenge in Syria is who would implement it and whether the United States, Nations would ever get permission to implement it given how Russia and China ha has positioned themselves with, with their veto power in the Security Council. I'll wait for other, for later for questions.